Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second session of this um, Sunoikis uh, full um, module uh, on digital culture heritage. Today, we're talking about uh, digital um, geographical annotations, and our speakers for today are Alton Barker from the Open University and Gadi Rees from the British Library, and we will conclude with a tutorial uh, that I will give myself. But I know that Elton has uh, the introduction covered, so I'm uh, handing it over to him uh, now. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Elton Barker. Um, let me share my screen with you. Is that working for everybody? Do you see it? Yes. OK, start from <clears throat> so this session is about creating and visualizing geo annotations as Valeria has explained the geo there is the the geographic annotation so ways of making notes about geographic features in online documents and I think also the important question is why bother about this so the tutorial is going to be split into three I'm go I've got the privilege of kind of setting things up and I want to talk about various aspects of geo-annotation from the perspective of a researcher in the classical studies. So you know, my day job is doing ancient Greek stuff. I'm particularly interested in how um, ancient Greek narratives represent space. So that's that's my kind of my way into geo annotation. So I'll be talking about ideas of counter cartographic space, by which I mean narrative space rather than uh, Cartesian geography, you know, Google Maps and things like that. Secondly, really bringing out the idea of textual maps and and what uh, different features emerge when we think about how narratives organize space and represent uh, spatial features. And then thirdly, and I think one aspect of the kind of I guess the one of uh, what I would claim to be one of the characteristic features of counter cartographic space and textual maps in networks and, and place relations. And I'm going to be talking about these and setting up various issues, uh, talking about, um, I'm going to be talking about them through two different projects that I've been working on. First of all, um, a project looking at the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, and that was a Hestia project. And then secondly, the Pelagios Project's annotation platform called Regogito. This is something that Valeria will be getting onto uh, in the third section of the tutorial. Second section, Gethin will take over, and Gethin will talk about um, geo annotation really from a GLAM perspective. So that's um, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. So basically, geo annotation in cultural heritage. He's going to be talking about geo parsers, this, this um, mechanism of extracting geographic. Uh, entities from a, from different kinds of documents, then using Google Fusion tables for geocoding, and then thirdly, Palladio, which is a network visualization tool for visualizing the data on the map. And I'm going to be paying particular attention to that because yeah, I've been generating networks too, but in a very hand encoded fashion. So I'm I'm, I'm going to be switched on to what Gethin is talking about there, and then in the third part of the tutorial. This is what this is when things really get um, kind of hands on. This is where Valeria will be talking in more detail about Recogito, this annotation platform that I'm going to be uh, mentioning in my presentation. But first of all, kind of why I'm interested in geo-annotation, why we should be interested in geo-annotation. And I think it's really because we, you know, we don't have any ancient we don't have any maps in the ancient world, but we do have a lot of textual evidence about the way in which ancient Greeks and Romans thought about um, the geography around them and thought in particular about the ideas of place and space. And one of the, I think, the key interesting first texts to really confront this issue of uh, representing uh, geography and the difficulties of representing geography is in this ancient Greek historian called Herodotus. He's writing about 420 uh, BCE. He's writing about this uh, conflict, major conflict between his people, the Greeks and the Persians. And to get to his core question of why is it these two peoples came into conflict with each other, he describes the world and, and, the, and the state of the world. And at one particular point in the histories, he actually talks about 
um, contemporary cartographic attempts to represent the world. And this is the first passage that you see um, on the presentation. I laugh to see how many have before now drawn maps of the world, not one of them reasonably, for they draw the world as round as if fashioned by compasses encircled by the ocean river and Asia and Europe of a like extent. So here we have Herodotus, a writer, engaging with um, a different kind of way of representing space, a kind of cartographic representation. And I think what's really interesting is how Herodotus encodes geographic information in his narrative. And this is what survives from the ancient world. And I think it's really interesting to try to extract that information and use that to dialogue with our own ways of representing space when we were so familiar now with uh, mapping technologies and google earth and things and this is one one thing that um, an ancient world scholar called alex purvis has has talked about she's talked about how um this idea of the spatial legacy of uh, uh, of a plot of a narrative is really pervasive in ancient greek thought where um, songs or narratives might be conceived as pathways or routes through, uh, um, um, through a particular kind of writing. So that, I think this gives a different kind of ground up view of how one puts together space and then an interesting, I think, confrontation of our idea of maps, uh, of uh, places that kind of dots on maps. So there's a kind of counter cartographic impulse, I would suggest, uh, that, that can be extracted from the ancient world. Uh, to give you another example, as I, if for our project uh, that was focusing on trying to extract um, geographic information, spatial information from Herodotus, that was called Hestia. We were we took one particular book, that was uh, book five of Herodotus' histories, and this is the first. What I've given you here is the first uh, sentence from book five of the histories. Those Persians whom Darius had left in Europe under the command of Megabazdus, finding the Perinthians unwilling to be Darius's subjects, subdued them before any of the other people of the Hellespont. These Perinthians had already been roughly handled by the Paeonians, for the oracle of the god ordered the Paeonians from the stream on to march against Perinthus. Now, this is just a typical sentence in the auditors, but there's already a lot of spatial information encoded here, not just place information. We're going to be looking at one example of extracting place information in a second. But I've used this passage to kind of draw attention to how there are other elements here that aren't just about settlements. There's also geographic features, such as the stream on or the Hellespont. There are broader conceptual ways of thinking about space and place. Europe, for example, what does Europe mean in this context? And I think even more importantly, there's a way in which um, spatial information is encoded with through the people that Herodotus talks about. The, there's um, Herodotus talks about the Persians, the Corinthians, uh, the Paeonians. All of these references to people here are important ways of also describing the space, in particular movement through space of these peoples. This is something that Franco Moretti has talked about regarding uh, the place-bound nature of literary forms. And what I'm particularly, what I was particularly interested in with the Herodotus project was trying to extract these um, ways of encoding space to so not just place name information, but also people information and draw out the kind of the connections between them and using maps as a way to bring to light, as Moretti says here, the internal logic of a narrative, to see how a narrative is constructed uh, through spatial references. With the Herodotus project, we were using various different uh, methods, um, some quite theoretical and geographical, and others more from the digital map, what, the, what was then the emerging digital humanities. This goes back to 2008. A kind of a newish resource on the horizon then was the Perseus Classical Library. And th this was an amazing uh, kind of um, first step up for us in that we thought we would have to encode the text of Herodotus ourselves. But we were put on to uh, the idea of using Perseus. And uh, what I later learned, you know, the button not to press, the XML warning orange button there, which if you do press it, you get something like this. This is the XML TI encoding markup behind that uh, uh, page of Herodotus you saw with already important spatial information encoded. So the key thing here is to look for is Halicarnassus, that's where Herodotus is from, and all within the kind of the, the pointy, uh, kind of scary brackets is the metadata relating to Halicarnassus. This was already 
marked up or tagged. This is your geo annotation in the Perseus text. So in other words, you know, if, instead of having to do it ourselves, there was already the, the, the beginnings had been made by Perseus. We were able to then go through the text quite trivially, extract that data into a database, tidy it up a bit, and then basically plug Herodotus into mapping software to then investigate. Now, as part of this kind of setup, I also want to kind of draw attention to some of the quick wins and also the, the obstacles. So one of the quick wins here is that at an instant, you can get a glance, get a, get a comprehension of Herodotus's world. Um, we've um, color coordinated the different entities. So the red dots that you see are settlements, the blue dots are uh, physical features such as seas or rivers, mountains, the yellow dots are kind of regions. So you get a, at a glance, you get to see Herodotus's world, which although spread far and wide across the Mediterranean and into the Far East, is really focused around the, uh, the Aegean Sea and in particular the, kind of the Greek mainland and the Greek settlements along the Ionian coast here, what is now modern day Turkey. So that's really the kind of core focus. And as you see, as you go further away from that core center, the red dots, the settlements, the human footprint of the landscape fades out and you begin to see more uh, the kind of the blue features particularly up here in the north in Scythia the natural features the rivers taking over as you see the bounds of your Odysseus's knowledge kind of um, um, visualized here but hopefully you will also see the problems in that first of all we're representing settlements as dots well, maybe that's okay but what about a river a sea what about a region such as europe as we saw before to represent that as a dot is hardly satisfactory and that really gets to the issue of uh, and the problem what you're rubbing against what we were rubbing up against with was the technology so this we were plugging herodotus into existing technology in this case the gis how was this helping us to think about herodotus's narrative uh, in a different way and particularly the kind of the the, the way in which Herodotus makes connections in his narrative and the way in which he through, moves through space this is just a static image and so I think there's also an issue with what kind of technologies that we're using and how they to a certain extent enforce their own ideology and what we're doing and that's something to be I think to be aware of what we were interested in in particular I mean, in this idea of counter-graphic space and mapping textual space is to draw out the connections that Herodotus makes between places, which we certainly didn't see in that GIS map. So to give you one example, again, from book five, Herodotus says, these men's borders, it is said, reach almost as far as the Aneti on the Adriatic Sea. They call themselves colonists from Medea. How this has come about, I myself cannot understand, but all is possible in the long passage of time. However that may be, we know that the Ligas who dwell in land of Messalia use the word Sigonai for hucksters, and the Cyprians use it for spears. So here we see in a typical sentence in Herodotus' histories, Herodotus crisscrossing back and forth across the Mediterranean, drawing connections between places that are not topographically connected. So those places are not next to each other on a map. But nevertheless, Herodotus is drawing a connection. If you like a what we get, what we get to see here is a topological uh, uh, connection, a topological map. So I mentioned before how we are interested in how peoples can represent places, and here we again we see peoples being used to reference places: the Ligas, the Aneti, the Cyprians. Important geographic spatial elements in the text that aren't place name information, such as we were able to extract automatically from Perseus. So there was other information that we could geo annotate here. We're also interested in kind of relating those places and peoples to each other. So we came up with this idea of reading through. Uh, this one section of the textbook five it's a central book and looking at each sentence and seeing if there was a some kind of spatial entity either represented by a place or a peoples talked about in that sentence and if it's related to another and then basically drawing a relationship and there were different ways in which we could think about the relationship whether depending on whether there was movement or no movement transformation or not no, not any transformation i won't go into any details here but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about that. But really the point here is, is trying to think of an, a network picture here and a qualitative network picture. What do those network relationships mean? So we, we conducted this investigation. It's very philological approach, really, very um, non-digital approach. We just basically used um, an Excel spreadsheet. We identified the spatial entities. We put them into different columns, we related to them each other. And then the, the digital element was the visualization. 
And this is what we ended up with. This is your obligatory spaghetti monster when you're trying to visualize complexity. And, you know, of course, Herodotus' history is complex. We were with that. That should, we should have understood that and trying to even just one uh, book of Herodotus, trying to explore the spatial relationships of one book. It's a lot of lines. There's a lot of spatial information encoded in there was going to be a challenge, as you see. So one, I think, big, problem, big again, challenge for us all when, we, when we're encoding, uh, uh, particularly, I think, text and, and encoding uh, geo annotations in text is to think about well the output and think about how you visualize that output to simplify but not to um, underestimate the complexity. And this is something that Irad Malkin, who is one of the leading theorists on um, network analysis from a historical perspective, less so literary, but from a historical perspective, has talked about. You know, and he's talked about precisely this idea of spaghetti monsters that require long verbal explanations. Nevertheless, I think I, I want to retain the value of using a uh, network graphs in some form to, to bring about, as uh, Doreen Massey, a, a contemporary theorist on geography, has talked about the articulations within the wider power geometries of space, those intersections between different places and peoples, and I think equally importantly, the kind of the non-meetings up where the connections aren't made, the disconnections. Well, what might that look like? This is that spaghetti monster now cleaned up a bit um, using different uh, visualization software. So it gets really important to have, if not someone embedded in the team, at least people that you can talk to who are experts in network analysis and network analysis visualization. So this is now using kind of font size to draw attention to the importance of a particular place or people within a network. Those places are visualized by font size and also the fact that they're uh, drawn together towards the center of this network. So basically what you're beginning to see here is a topological map of your auditors, not the GIS map that you saw before with the places as dots in a familiar geographic terrain that we're, you know, that we're familiar with utterly from, from Google Maps. But reorganizing that same space through Herodotus's narrative construction of that space. So now Persia very much occupying the center ground, Athens, and also the relationship between these different communities. So that's how we were reimagining Herodotian space. Now, that aspect of the work, that geo annotation that we did there, I mentioned before, was hand encoding philological work um, that it would be great now to be able to click on this network map and bring out you know, go back to the data that we used but but we couldn't because that was just it was all done by hand it wasn't done digitally i think now things have moved on and in part due to a project that i've been involved with pretty much since the end of hestia since the end of the Herodotus project which is called Pelagios and that's um, what we're briefly going to look at here Valeria will go into more detail about this but basically this is uh, the annotation platform um, that we've developed in in, in Pelagios and um, our IT uh, guru Raina Simon has developed so this is a way of doing that encoding of narrative or indeed other Kinds of online documents, um, but now in a digital format, so all of that, um, all that information is captured and kept and stored for you to consult, for colleagues to consult, and if you want, if you want to make it open, the general public to consult. So I think another important aspect here to the digitality of geo annotation is the ability to. Um, keep, store, make transparent your working app, which is something that we couldn't do in the Hestia project. So how does this work? Here's your text of Herodotus again, book nine. Uh, what you see here is um, I've highlighted one particular place. It's called Thessaly. I want to mark this as a place. Um, so I double click on it. We get up a pop-up box. Record Gita is asking us, do you mean this place, Thessalia, that's in this gazetteer? Um, Valeria will take you through the details here. The important thing that I just want to flag up is the ability to, first of all, highlight and to mark up, if you like, the um, place information that you're interested in. So this is a way in which um, uh, you can imagine the Perseus text um, being developed, for example. So I'm able to say that Thessaly is a place, and just as importantly, I'm then able to say Thessa 
Thessaly is this place, and I'm pointing to an authority file um, that says you know, it has information about Thessalia. And that authority file is Pleiades, that's the online gazetteer of the Barrington Atlas. So it's the kind of the authority for the ancient world about places. So by that two-step process, first of all, identifying Thessalia character string in my text, I'm able to say that's a place. That second step, aligning that to Pleiades, I've said that it's this particular Thessaly, not this other one. And through that, that means I'm able to, again, visualize Herodotus. But more than that, rather than just getting that GIS map that you saw before, now I can click on any of these points, or indeed polygons, because Gregor Gita can handle kind of polygon area information as well, I can bring up the text. And that, that for me is really important to be able to kind of bring up this dialogue, this interaction between uh, being able to map the text and visualize the spatial information in the text and also to get back to the text to maybe check that annotation or to, to look at the broader context. So really keeping map and, and narrative now alongside each other and now I think that really brings out the virtue of maybe making maps out of text. There are other things you could do, so just to go back very briefly, this screen, I was talking about marking the entity as a place. Well, at the bottom here, you see add a tag. Well, what does adding a tag do? Well, you, you can develop a schema for adding tags. And here's one example. This is, I've mapped um, the famous catalogue of ships in Homer's Iliad book two, and I've used a tagging system to disambiguate between the different contingents, the Greek, the many Greek contingents and the Trojan contingents. And then I'm able to color code them very simply on the map interface that's that's part of the Rikugito annotation platform. So I'm then able at a glance to see the different contingents that, that Homer talks about. So really invaluable, I think, not only for research, but also for teaching purposes. And then the final thing I want to talk about, so this is what entering the last five minutes now, is that underneath the hood of that annotation platform you've been looking at and that particular that second step of aligning my place annotation my geo annotation to a gazetteer is the idea of linked data the idea of linking out to other resources other online documents that might hold information about that place and this is again important stuff for a cultural historian or a, lit or a literary uh, um, theorist because places aren't just um, isolated objects, as we've seen with Herodotus. Herodotus is constantly uh, relating places to each other. And to get a better um, contextualization of the places ourselves, we can, and in the future, I think, link out from texts like Herodotus to other kinds of information, you know, other kinds of resources that hold really important information about those places. So Edward Casey here talking about how places also gather experiences, histories, and really the important relational nature of the place. So what might this look like? Corinthus is one place that Herodotus mentions at the beginning of book five, if you remember. Here, using a different tool that um, Pelagios has developed, we now see other kinds of information that um, uh, that is the uh, other kinds of resources that hold information about Perinthius, largely kind of coin collections. This would be a way as a classicist for to um, explore different kinds of disciplinary information, archaeological information in particular, that as a literary critic, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily have immediate access to, but would nevertheless might be important for my understanding, in particular my contextualization of my work on Herodotus. So in kind of a conclusion to this section, I want to leave uh, leave some issues about what I've just shown, because I, I seem to have given a kind of a nice uh, narrative evolution from the kind of the issues that were arising when we didn't have a, um, a digital annotation platform. Do I now record you to this annotation platform that uh, Palancios has developed solves everything? Well, not quite. Um, so I'm just embarking on a new project about Pausanias, which is, is even more spatial than Herodotus. It's really about uh, the construction of space and the construction of a sense of Greece, actually, in the ancient world. There's been incredibly influential on the way people still think about Greece and the way archaeology is done, for example. So this is me um, annotating, using Rekogito, geo-annotating, using Rekogito, place information. So this is, if you like, that a uh, first a screenshot of Persis that I showed you. This is just place information. And I've 
each of these place entities, each of these entities I've marked as places and an alignment to the gazetteer. So this is places as entities. But there's other information here. So there's also uh, spaces as well here. Um, there's the idea of locatives, you know, grammatical constructions uh, on the Greek mainland facing the Cycladic islands. These place entities aren't isolated islands. They are part of a narrative. So it's really important to capture that information. There's other information here too. There are time uh, identifiers when you have rounded, where once the Athenians at silver mines. So there's also the sense of um, place, space, and time coming together. You know, the famous notion of Bakhtin, the chronotype, how uh, space and time are, are related to each other. And that's a kind of fundamental characteristic of, of narrative itself. And then there's also aspects of focalization. When you have rounded the promontory, when Antigonus, son of Demetrius, was ravaging their country. So there's a lot of other information to capture here that. I think enriches the idea of the geo annotation. So, what I mean to say is that there's um, there isn't just the kind of the narrative voice here, and it's not, it wouldn't. I think there's an interest above us just um, extracting geo information here that Pausanias is encoded. But I think it'd be important for us to think about who is visualizing, who is talking about the particular kind of spatial information at any particular moment in the narrative and being able to extract that. And then it gets really complicated because then we can think about relationships as well. So relating these different spatial entities to each other. So it's not just the single entity, again, in isolation, but thinking about how those entities relate to each other. For example, the Cycladic Islands and the Aegean Sea being on the Greek mainland, for example. Rekogito can enable you to link those different entities with each other. But I think a key, um, I think, question for us is, well, OK, we can link, but what are we linking? What are we doing when we're linking? So what kind of schema can we come up, can we come up with that can make sense? And that, OK, a uh, some kind of spaghetti monster might well be the kind of the end result, but at least we can pick our way through that spaghetti monster and make sense of it. So really, the idea of geo-annotation or semantic annotation more generally is about complexity, it's about plurality, and above all, it's about interpretation. And that's really the, the kind of key thing I want to leave with you, in that as you're doing geo-annotation, it's not just about identifying a place. It's really getting an annotation platform like Rekogit is getting you to think about what does place mean in this context and how can you relate it to other entities that are important for thinking about that place. Thank you. That's uh, that's my that's my bit done. Uh, thank you, Alton. I think this yeah links up perfectly, really, with our previous class and with some of our uh, future ones. So thank you very much for that. And I'm um, I'm handing it over to Gethin now. If you mute yourself, you are now presenting to everyone. Hello there, I'm Gethin Rees from the British Library. Uh, good afternoon. So um, I'll just share my slides with you now. Um. Okay, we can see the slides. Okay, um, so I'm, yeah, my name is Gethin Rees. Uh, I'm, I work as the curator of digital mapping at the British Library. And uh, when people want to come and use the collections of the library, I'm, uh, people often come to me uh, suggesting that they want to visualize the collections on a map in some way or interpret or do some form of spatial analysis using the collections. and on the whole, that usually means they want to make this relationship between text and geography that Elton outlined earlier. Now, what I'm going to do in this presentation is introduce a few other tools that you can hopefully use in your own research or in your own in writing your own thesis. And um, I'm you, introducing tools that are really available. Um, to you through the web. Now, 
As Elton uh, also mentioned, it's important to ask why visualization? And um, when we think of visualization, we think of, you know, um, aids that range from scribbled diagrams to virtual reality environments. And how can these be useful to research? So Elton really uh, outlined a lot of uh, potential use cases. But I'm in terms of the tools I'm going to uh, introduce, perhaps two uh, use cases are, are worth bearing in mind. Um, the first is to communicate a message to others. And here we're, I'm thinking of a traditional map or printed illustration, really. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, in, in some sense, it's a one directional um, communication. Whereas the second is visualization being a tool to help process information and generate new knowledge. And that's really what uh, Recogito and some of the network analysis and um, GIS analysis that Elton was discussing can do. So it's in a lot of ways, it's this interactivity that can help this second form of visualization. And really, the web has brought this on to a new level. So if I've introduced how visualization can help research, but secondly, how what is specific about geography that can, and geographical visualization that can aid your research? Well, I think the first point is it really, um, through viewing um, data on a map, geographical data on a map, you can aid engagement. Now, People can um, people can re really relate to place, and it you can either aid your own engagement with the data set by helping yourself under, um, understand that data set and interrogate it in a new way. Or second, with the advent of, of web maps and academic resources online that disseminate data using web maps, you can really help other people um, engage with your data. You know. Uh, if I'm looking at, uh, I'm from Edinburgh, if I look at a, a, a resource, I'm immediately drawn, with a web map, I'm immediately drawn to Edinburgh. It gives me, an, uh, the, I'm I can see there's data that's relevant to me, data that I understand the geography of, and I can immediately then find a way of entering that, that data set. But a second use of digital, of geographical data visualization that's important is the, to stimulate new or innovative interpretations. So browsing data from a geographical perspective, or um, particularly if it's possible to then browse it in reference to attribute or also in reference to uh, the temporal dimension, um, allows you to detect patterns that you wouldn't see from just looking at those data in a spreadsheet, just reading a text or looking at um, data in other formats. So that can then send your research off or in really new directions and, um, I, and really help to uh, further your understanding of the data. And finally, when you have a, a, a very large set of data, um, we're now living in this era of big data, you know, many of the, uh, the British libraries um, data sets such as our newspaper, our OCR newspaper collections or our web archive do count as big data in that they, you can't, uh, they're difficult to, uh, in, to work with on your own uh, computer, on your own laptop, say, and due to, their, uh, due to the processing power that's available. And being able to quickly summarize those large data sets on a map can provide a really useful overview and, uh, and help you understand quickly what might be missing from the data set. Are there errors in the data set? Uh, is this, what types of uh, interpretations might I be able to use this, this data set for? So for, I would say through engagement, through stimulating new or innovative geographical interpretations, and through uh, examining big data sets, geographical visualization can be really um, useful. Now, El now Elton has really given a very nuanced and, and frankly, uh, erud extremely erudite um, 
discussion of the relationship between um, space and place and um, the relationship between spatial narrative and place. But I'm just going to uh, make a couple of points that are related to that, that are, and are, are a couple of uh, issues to just bear in mind when you're thinking about using the tools that I'm going to introduce in a minute. So the first is that um, humanities data set don't really deal with look don't deal with location they uh, contain places and the tools that I'm going to introduce like a traditional geographical information system basically in visualize locations and that that distinction is an important one to uh, to to bear in mind so these places don't exist a place doesn't exist without time so for example if we think of London or we think of the term Londinium um, the two are, make one think of quite a different place, despite the, the location they share in common. So, so, sorry, sorry, um, sorry, 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 Gabriel, are you showing something on your slides that it's not just wide geographical visualization? Uh, no, no, I'm, okay. uh, okay. I'm okay. going to come in a second. No, that's fine. No, <laughs> <you're> fine. <laughs> um, but no, I will come in to come into that. In this, uh, I'll be when I come to the demos of the tools, I'll be uh, dealing with that. Um, with there'll be more slides. Um, now, the second is that today we will be um, visualizing places as points only. And we have to bear in mind that this is reductive. As, as uh, Recogito shows, you know, um, points, polygons uh, are, are potential visualizations of place, but also um, networks and uh, there's uncertain and visualization of uncertainty are important too. Um, we must also uh, realize that it's not possible really to, uh, in many cases, to visualize the complexity of place uh, on a map in, in many cases. So, so the next question is how, how to visualize these things. And I'm gonna just introduce these three tools as, um, uh as we as have been mentioned earlier so these days you know we're lucky today 10 or 20 years ago we would have uh you would have in order to do geographical info visualization you would have had to have used gis software or write code and um that required particular training and expertise but more you know in more recently with web 2 and the uh, um and interactive websites become more common. You know, these GIS capabilities are available to all of us in a very simple format that um, on, on the web. Now, I'm going to, but today I'm going to uh, use data from this project, the Business of Women's Words, as an example uh, from the, uh, to use these tools. Now you could use the tools with any text that you have written or text that you are studying. And um, these, you, in the, yeah, any text you've written or text you're studying, and these should be in a, t in a text file format. Um, now, Business of Women's Words is a project that's looking at feminist publishing in the 20th century. And we're, they're taking uh, a range of different, um, feminist publications and we are OCRing the text and we're um, creating digital maps and we're creating those for two reasons. One is is to, the first is to do spatial and some spatial analysis for publications associated with the project, while the second is to uh, the second is to disseminate um, data over the web from the project. So there's the spare, this, the feminist magazine spare rib has been um, digitized and we are looking to create web maps in the project's web space that can, uh, that, that represent places mentioned in the magazine. And um, through clicking through these, these web maps, people will be able to access articles that they are, are interested in, in in the magazine. 
And this is something that we're looking at all, um, a, a lot more across the library. How can we use uh, space or place or location in order to um, from text that we hold in order to make the collections of the library more accessible to users, whether that's collection in the catalog or in our own um, on, on our website, uh, you, you know, um, collection item entries that curators have written up so that people can access those online as well as on site. So the first um, example of using these business of women's words data I'm going to mention is the, is the Edinburgh Geoparser. And the Geoparser is a method, it provides a tool to extract place names from the text. So in this um, presentation, I'm just going to demo the, use the online demo, but it is possible to also install a version locally, which is much more powerful and which is much more powerful and powerful and will allow you to extract place names from a, a very large amount of text. Now, the GeoParser is an Edinburgh University product and um, uh, and it's been actually the take up of it's been very good um, throughout the humanities. And I think uh, a former project of Elton's, I believe, Google Ancient Places also used it. So do um, do look at do look at Google Ancient Places as well, if that's still live um it's, a, it's an excellent application of it so i'm just going to um go to the actual uh the site here so if we if so this is the geoparser basically it allows you to choose your file you can upload some uh i'm going to upload some text from some letters from the uh business of from an issue of spare rib. And um, if we look here, the GeoParser basically, the online demo highlights the, highlights the place names there. It gives you the um, most, it, it basically queries geo names, which is a gazetteer, similar to the gazetteer like Pleiades, but um, from, from modern places, the uh, Pleiades was what is one of the gazetteers that Recogito uses, and that was discussed earlier, I believe. And um, so it gives us the coordinates for the places here, and um, and puts the places from the text on the map. So this is um, you, when I first showed these um, this to the researchers on the project. They, they'd been uh, buried deep in these issues of spare rib, um, close reading them, and um, they immediately, looking at the map, they immediately saw that um, there are issues with, uh, the, it immediately prompted questions in their mind about the regional development of the movement and whether the movement was urban or regional, or, sorry, urban or rural, and the relationship between um, the letter writers and the feminist movement as a whole in the time. So it's a, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a simple way of just prompting some new questions when using simply a text file. Okay, and um, so the URL is available uh, on the slide here for the demo. And there's also an excellent tutorial there on the Programming Historian site. I, I mean, I'd really recommend the Programming Historian um, set of tutorials anyway for really for any for a very wide variety of digital uh, skills that are relevant to the humanities but the geoparser tutorial is great if you want to actually install that and get it working with a larger text locally so the next um tool i'm going to look at is uh geocoding with google fusion tables so in some cases, you might have a spreadsheet with a column of places already. And in these instances, in Google Fusion tables can be very useful. Um, they do make some very useful tools, Google, um, despite some of the other uh, issues that, uh, that, that we face in using their products. But um, so if we, if, if I 
go to the the fusion table it's a simple it really is an extremely simple process you to in order to create a fusion table you can um you can simply upload a spreadsheet and a spread is either a spreadsheet or a csv file um you then you'll then find a, t a table like this this contains some of the places again from the letters page of spare rib and um by clicking going to file and geocode um do put uh you can then specify the column add a location hint um i would recommend doing adding a location hint otherwise you'll get places all across the world but i'm um, like the uk and very quickly you can again um have a map with the distribution of your uh of your uh of the of the places from your spreadsheet now the real benefit of this is then the fact that you can then share the um the tool so if you you can then share the map and embed and when i say share the map you can actually you can either give a link to people or you can actually embed that map as a piece of html in a, in your web page or blog and uh updates to the fusion table will update the map the the html iframe that is in your um, web page. So that uh, um, that is really a tremendously powerful um, visualization dissemination uh, device, and it's something that uh, we that we use at the British Library when we want to quickly uh, have have a have a have a web map on our on our web space. So the final tool I'm going to introduce is Palladio. Um, so yeah, so there's also another tutorial there for Google Fusion Tables, but it really is quite straightforward. And there's your URL for the Fusion Tables. Um, if you, unfortunately, you cannot you don't you can't download the coordinate data at least i wasn't I, i've not been able to download the coordinate data from the fusion table if anyone finds out how to do that do let me know by the way um but uh a tool this other this batch geocode tool is a is a tool for actually allowing you to download the coordinate data and and with such downloaded coordinate data you can um you can upload that to palladio now this is a this is a really powerful uh data visualization tool for the humanities it's it's um really a great great piece of work from stanford the humanities and design lab i think they've really got their user experience working well there um it, uh the tool looks um really uh beautiful and the maps that you can produce are, are, are really great on there now I've not got time to get into a lot of the detail of the uh, of some of the more powerful features of the tool today, but uh, do check it out. There's a couple of tutorials here as well, but I will just um, show you some of the basics. Um, the first, you can you I can upload a, a spreadsheet. Um, you do need coordinates already for this. So you, if you'd use one of the geocoding tools that I discussed earlier, um, you can put your, you, to add coordinates to your place names or, um, or a spreadsheet that you've taken from the geo parser and with the, that you've added coordinates. You can then, um, you can then put these places into the box um, and and then and and um, click load. One thing that you should that should be noted actually, and it took me a little while. If you're using this, is that the coordinates need to, in order for them to display properly, you need to put both coordinates in the same column with a comma between them, and um, you put coordinates in the same column with a comma between them. So it's one column for both coordinates, otherwise it won't work. And um, and then if we up, if you load the data, you then are, uh, have these different tabs here. If we click on map, then 
uh, you click on map, new layer, new layer, and coordinates, and then you will see the uh, then the, the you know the the points that appear on the map. And I think one of the going back to what I said in the initial instance about the two forms of dissemination, Google Fusion tables will allow people to have an interactive map that you can embed as a piece of HTML in your web page. Whereas Palladio here, I think, um, although it has a lot of um, higher, um, although it has a lot of powerful functions that are are, are useful in um, such as the network analysis function that uh, Elton um, alluded to earlier, it, uh, I think that it also allows you to produce nice looking maps that you can then use in your publications or in your thesis um, really very quickly. Um, I think a map like there's a scale there, a map like this could would look excellent in your, uh, would look excellent in, in, in uh, thesis. And uh, so it goes back to that um, traditional map uh, vis uh, communication model that um, for the uh, a single direction of uh, visu visualization example. So, um, so that's my third. Uh, that's my third tool, and you know, there's again, there's really, as I, as I mentioned, actually, there's, it's really well um, documented, and Palladio has some excellent tutorials. So, just to sum up, then, I would say geography offers a new perspective on your data. It's uh, it's a uh, it can it's really often surprising what you will uh, can appreciate from visualizing the data geographically, and just give it a shot. You don't know, um, all you need to do is throw the text into some, or throw a spreadsheet into some of these web apps, and you really don't know what it might uh, might throw up. Exploration can really give you new insights and change the course of your, of, or change the direction of your research. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Uh, uh, that was, I mean, always useful to expand our suite of tools. I didn't know uh, Palladio very well. I'll definitely check that out. Um, and I will now turn my camera on. Yeah. And I will conclude this uh, seminar uh, with a brief tutorial of Recogito, which is one of the tools that have been mentioned during this presentation. Um, and Alton has already uh, shown some of uh, some research application of uh, Recogito, some of its functionality. So what we're going to do together now, it's really a, a short brief how to um, create your own annotations in, uh, in Recogito. I won't go uh, too much into why this is useful and what are you know, the, the, the problems and what are you know, the conceptual uh, pitfalls that you can find. I will just show you how to create your annotations in Recogito. So let me share my screen. Okay. All right. Uh, let me also find. Okay, this is our Recogito um, window. Can you see my screen? Uh, you're all muted. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, okay, this is our uh, Recogito window. And Recogito is a free online um, annotation platform that allows you to um, annotate, create annotations on both text and image format, and to a lesser extent on spreadsheets as well. So our example that I was already preparing uh, in the background is um, one of the books of the Thucydides, uh, History of the Peloponnesian War, and um, I'm just uploading it into uh, into Recogito, and you can see that the upload process is very, very, um, it's quick and easy. You just drop it. By the way, I wanted to show, the, the reason why I wanted to show you the upload process is that I wanted to um, bring uh, attention to this 
a little message that you get here, which is this, uh, do you want to apply automatic annotation or not? Um, and if we leave it enable, as we are going to do now, what happens is that a recogito goes through the text that we're uploading word by word and tries to identify those words that um, it believes are either places or names. And we'll highlight them for us to, to check. And of course, we cannot rely 100% on the accuracy of this, and we cannot rely uh, on the fact that Recogito will catch all the kind of information that we want um, to, to annotate in our document, but it can be uh, a useful uh, starting point. And we will see uh, in, our, um, in our example, how can we make the most of this um, of these suggestion. Um, let give, um, uh, let's give Recogito a few more seconds to, um, to upload. So it is important to bear in mind that the only text format uh, that Recogito can accept at the moment is TXT. Um, you, can, um, you can create or you can convert TXT documents with any of the you know, most common um, text editors, so uh, Word, but also OpenOffice and uh, Google Documents export in TXT as well, so that shouldn't be a problem, but this is the only uh, text format that Recogito can deal with. Um, for the images, we'll see uh, briefly uh, later, it can also um, process all the major image formats, so TIFF, PNG, and JPEG. So let's see what happened to our, um, to our document. This is our workspace. These are all the documents that, we, that I have uploaded on my personal account. And all, this doc all the documents by default are private. I only I can see them, but very much like a Google document, I can decide if I want to share them just with some, you know, with a group of users and uh, manage the privileges that these users have if they can or cannot modify what I'm showing to them. But I can also make this public and have um, everyone uh, either seeing or even collaborating with me uh, on this on this document. So here is our uh, history of the Peloponnesian world. Let's see what happened. As I anticipated, some of the words have been highlighted for us by, by Recogito, by this algorithm that is an NER, is a name entity recognition that try to identify places and people. So let's click on one of these uh, words that Recogito is prompting and see what happens. Let's click on Sicily. And what Recogito is trying to do is to match this string of text, Sicily, to a place that is called Sicily, that is in one of its gazetteers. And we talked about gazetteers last week, and we know that you know, we have more than one because they uh, cover different historical and cultural and conceptual uh, entities. And what Recogito is trying to suggest here is that we associate this, um, this word Sicily with the entity Sicily that is in GeoNames, which is a contemporary gazetteer. And although that would be, let's say, geographically correct, uh, because, well, Sicily is an island and it's still, you know, uh, the same island. On the other hand, it wouldn't be entirely appropriate because the Sicily that Thucydides is talking about is this, the Sicily that is conceptually represented, not in geonames, but in the Pleiades gazetteer. So although the location is sort of, you know, sort of right, I want to change this anyway and actually go for this Sicilia island that is in Pleiades. So what I do is I select the gazetteer entry that I think is more appropriate from this list, and then I click on it, and I have created an annotation. And you see that this annotation that makes a link between the word Sicily in my text and um, um, an entity in a gazetteer in an uh, external authority list this annotation as an author, that is me, this is my username, and it has um, a timestamp. So it's like a very, very tiny uh, publication. So let's say, okay. And this is um, Recogito really trying to be our friend and trying to help us and saying, okay, the word Sicily appears 79 more times in this um, in this text. Do you want to um, reapply this annotation? 
So this feature in Recogito can be your best friend or your worst enemy. Um, so think carefully before you use it, but also um, there are two major options that are just yes, apply it and no, don't apply it. But also we quite recently, our developer Reiner developed a few more options uh, because we realized that people, you know, sometimes wanted to keep something and change something else, to reapply only part of the annotation, to, you know, to reapply the tags, but not the gazetteer and so on. So we have now developed this uh, suite of choices uh, for the reapply feature. So what we want to do is to say to all the annotations that Recogito had created, saying that Sicily was maybe uh, that Sicily in geonames, we want to tell Recogito, no, we want that word Sicily, each time it occurs, to be actually associated with Pleiades. So what we are telling Recogito is, first of all, require full word match. So Recogito won't try to apply, uh, for example, the annotation uh, uh, Sicilia for the word Siciliani, which is a longer word that contains the word Sicilia. No, it will require a, a perfect um, full word match. So the word has to be surrounded by either white space or a punctuation mark. Um, we want to apply this change to um, all the annotated matches. And we don't want to append the changes. If we append the changes, we will have two annotations, one in geonames and one in uh, Pleiades. We want to replace the annotation. So let's say apply changes. And now if we click on Sicily, it says Sicilia Island. And it says so in all of the occurrences of the word Sicily. Recogito has substituted for us the annotation that he had provisionally made and we told him and we told it it was wrong so it has created uh, it has done this bulk adjustment of our annotations but one of the um one of the point of uh, doing annotation of a text is also to identify those connections that are not as um explicit not as obvious as they you know could immediately be so for example the word trinacria is just you know another way to call sicily and this time uh, actually recogito and player this code this so this is a good guess uh, trinacria is actually one of the names of sicily so we can just confirm this and say okay uh, but also if we want to annotate the fact that the island in this text is probably is you know at this point definitely against Sicily. So let's create an annotation from scratch. We just highlight the text, and we say we tell Recogito that this is a place, and Recogito is trying to guess what is this island? Is it Crete? No, no, Recogito is not Crete. So let's go to change. At this point, we have to to help our um, interface a little bit because the island is just too generic a word. So we if we change. The word that is here in the search field, we can say something that is, you know, more useful, like Sicily, which is what we mean by the island, and create another annotation that again points to the same, um, to the same entity in player that gets it here. And this time, when we say okay. Do we want to, re to reapply this to all occurrences? I would discourage this because we don't know in the text later on if we are um, talking about if each time we say the island we are actually referring to Sicily or not. So let's say no at this point. And uh, one other thing that we can do to refine our annotation is to um, add tags and comments. So, for example, um, if we were looking at, okay, Syracuse, uh, it's not Syracuse in your name, let's change that. Let's say that is Syracuse, the one in play it is. And let's also add a tag. And let's say that uh, the tag is um, one, of the, one of the peoples that were um, living in Sicily in ancient times. So let's say is the... Uh, this is one of the towns of the Siculi. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter now if it is correct or not. It's just an example. Let's play to to, to create a tag 
you write a word in this field and you just hit enter and you see that now the word is surrounded by um, a rectangle that means that we have created a tag if you want to um, reapply uh, a tag that you have already used recogito will suggest it while you start typing s it will suggest like or do you mean securely and we'll try to autocomplete which can be uh, handy so let's say okay now in this case if we want to reapply the annotation we are reapplying not only the match with the gazetteer but we're also applying the tag to all the occurrences of syracuse so let's replace annotation so we will get rid of the geonames one that was wrong and let's say apply changes now all the occurrences of syracuse will have the tag and the match with the with the player this gazetteer okay um very quickly um we can also um uh, create annotations about things that are uh, not places but the reason why uh, we um, recognize the works particularly well with place annotations is that we can then create um, map based visualizations of um, of our text and as Elton showed before with Herodotus you can already have at a glance an idea of what are the places that are uh, most prominent uh, in this text and you can see that um, some dots are bigger than others because they have received more um, annotations so this is the, the dot for Sicily I bet yes and you can see the annotations one by one as we have seen and you can check a little bit of context and for example I can see uh, that um, this visualization of course is based on both the annotation that I have created but also the annotations that Recogito has done uh, automatically so um, Actually, only the green one are verified and the gray one are automatic. And we can already say for sure that the Italy that Recogito has tried to match is not the correct one because this is modern Italy, but it's not the Italy that uh, Thucydides had in mind. So let's jump to text and correct this annotation because we, we really don't like this. And let's look for... Okay, this, this sounds more appropriate. And replace. All right. Now let's look at our map view. And we see that that polygon has disappeared. And now Italy is just, you know, a center point, is a, a more generic, more blurred center point uh, to, um, to, show, um, to show the concept of Italy in ancient times. But okay. Um, we can also create uh, annotations about persons, for example, let's say the Cyclops. Um, in this case, we, we say person, and we don't have the equivalent of uh, a disambiguation feature for persons as we have for places, but we are already creating an annotation that says, you know, this is a person. And we can refer to an external list of authority, maybe a wiki data entry or a prosopographical entry, just adding it in the comment. If we change the visualization mode uh, from verification status to entity type, we will see that places are uh, green, although some of the ones that Recogito has guessed were uh, places are actually uh, people, and blue will be, uh, would be uh, persons. If we were uh, tagging events as well, so let's say to sale, okay, let's, let's say that we are very much interested in uh, tagging movement. So this is an event, and we have created a tag movement. We say okay, uh, no, and our event annotation is pink. Uh, now, because we really don't have time, I just want to show you super quickly that Recogito can also annotate more than one document, more than one file at a time, creating one single bundle of documents. So, for example we could upload uh, different um, uh, different documents together different files together like for example here we have five different accounts from five different authors of the ancient world they, they are all describing at the same place that is arabia and in that case we can then uh, these are 
uh, annotations made by students. I have no responsibility on the, uh, on the accuracy of these annotations, but the annotations are then visualized um, in a, in a, you know, all together, but at the same time, we can then color code by part and see from which of the uh, different documents the annotations come. And when we see something white, it means that I received annotation from one, more than one source, which usually makes it a more interesting uh, case to, to, to go check. Um, very quickly, I'm going to show you annotation of images. Um, and I will use Okay, this beautiful map is actually only part of a map because I could only download part of it, uh, but I am very, 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 very fond of it. Uh, as we were dealing with Sicily, I've decided to use a map of Sicily for, for this uh, demonstration. And uh, as you may notice, it is actually a bilingual uh, map of uh, Sicily. So it has both the Italian and the Arabic. So what you can do um, when you annotate an image in Recogito, well, first of all, it doesn't have to be a map. You can annotate any kind of image. Uh, although, again, the best uh, performance is usually with uh, geographic features. Um, so the things that you can do on an image with Recogito are creating a point annotation or select an area of the uh, map that is, um, that is relevant to you. Um, so for example, if I want to create a point annotation and saying that here there is a Shireale, I just click and uh, I don't need to transcribe here. Yeah, well, let's say a Shireale. And say that this is a place. It's not finding it. Let's say search. Uh, Let's try it. Okay. Uh, we will use uh, geonames for, for this one. And we can just say, okay. And we have created a point annotation. But we may also want to um, select a part of the map. And so we just draw a box around, for example, one of the place names. And then we say that is um, it's a place. Uh, I think that is now just called Achikatena or something. Okay. Oops. Okay, you've seen how to create, um, uh, how to select a part of the image. And if we go into the map view, that you may think it's redundant when you are annotating a map, but it really is not, especially if you're working with bilingual maps, because then you can click on one of your annotations and, for example, compare the Italian word for Messina and the Arabic word for Messina, uh, but also uh, the uh, the city of Messina, how it was uh, drawn on the map. Uh, of course, you can also create um, a bundle of maps uh, in the same way that we have seen um, a bundle of text documents before. Uh, like in this case, this was a British Library um, project, uh, some maps were um, were crowd annotated and that was the Egerton Atlas and all the annotations uh, coming from the different uh, pages of the manuscript have all been annotated and they can be all uh, visualized together but as we have seen we can color code by part and and we can know from which of the folio uh, the annotations um, come from and as we have said when we see white it means that we have more than one annotation and we can browse the different snippet of image and compare them um, one by one. Okay, we are running out of time. Just uh, quickly, when you have created your annotations, you can then download them. And this is one of the, uh, one of the most interesting features in Recogito, is that you can create annotations you know, very easily in this very simple interface, but then you can download them in a, in a series of um, you know, quite useful 
uh, formal languages from a simple CSV to JSON-LD, and we can also now export uh, in uh, um, TI XML that we retain the place annotations. Um, if you want to know more about Recogito, just uh, go on our on the Pelagius Commons website. There are also other tutorials in the previous Sunoikisis uh, classes. Um, and I think we can stop here. Um, I can stop my screen sharing. OK. And if there are um, any questions, uh, I'm very, very happy Huh. I'm, I'm just checking now the, the comments. Uh, Gabby is saying, uh, do, you, do you want to say that aloud, Gabby? The, the, the comment that you have left in the, in the chat? No, OK. <laughs> it's all right. And uh, Anissa is asking a simple question. Montesian translation into Portuguese over Herodotus. Um, Pelagius will not find the geonames in Portuguese, so I have to make the link manually. Uh, would be this a way to add the Portuguese names to the existing, to existing names in other languages? Uh, so what you should do to enhance uh, this, this process is actually to add the Portuguese translation to play this, I would say, so that the gazetteer would actually recognize that when you are looking for the Portuguese, a variant of the name you are actually referring to, um, you know, to the Greek and the and the English one that are more easily found um, in the in the interface. Uh, but yes, the NER, so the automatic recognition, definitely won't work very well with Portuguese. And also, I'm afraid that in Pleiades uh, there is a bit of a lack of um, languages that are not. Uh, either you know the original language of the place or English. So I would I I would be oh yeah also uh, creating a, a Portuguese gazetteer would also uh, would also be uh, would also be a possible approach. Um, are there any? Any questions? Uh, any more questions? I I am inclined to 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 close this uh, here because we are already a couple of minutes late. So if there are no other questions, I would thank uh, my my guest speaker Elton and Gethin, and in particular Elton because I know that he had to leave, but I see that he that he's still online. So thank you very much for that. And okay, see you next week. Thank you everyone and goodbye.